Thank you for the privilege of being able to stand here again. Today, people have decided to enlist in the army of the Lord. There's a battle unseen by human eyes that is being waged right now. And the army of the Lord is on the ground seeking to save souls. And Satan has his hosts also at work trying in every possible way to deceive and to destroy. This battle is as real as any battle out there on any earthly battlefield. But the stakes are far higher than an earthly battle. To enlist in the army of the Lord is a very, very serious issue. And what a privilege to be called into the army of the Lord at the 11th hour and to receive the same wages, eternal life. You cannot cut the wage, you either have it or you don't. It's all or nothing. Now we've been using a theme of late, and it comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not only do we in the army of the Lord fight to save souls out there, but the battle which rages at the highest level is the battle against self. That's the greatest battle we will ever have to fight. It's easier to go and die for a cause out there than it is to change one bad character trait. And if we read further in Romans chapter 12 as an introduction, Paul speaks about the grace given to him, that he should not think himself higher than it is given him to be. In other words, God in this battle is not calling us to be bombastic, but he's calling us to humility. That's the opposite of a worldly battle. Isn't it the opposite? They're so diametrically opposed to each other. It's such a war to get this big I am great feeling out of him. And then when he calls you into an army, he also calls you into rank and file. And this is very important in the times that we live. We think we can do whatever we want to. No, he calls us into rank and file. So he says in verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So when new people enlist, do those that have enlisted before have a responsibility? Yes or no? They certainly do. We are individually enlisted, but we are cooperatively accountable one to another. And each one of those who is enlisted, just as you have in an army, different functions, different battalions, different regiments, with different tasks. So exactly the same happens in the army of the Lord. And we must appreciate the gift of someone else, even if it is diametrically a the opposite of what our gift is. Because God deals with many, many characters. I always say, well, the two who are exactly identical here, please stand up. Nobody wants to stand up. Okay. He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, 
Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, not lagging in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Boy, these are hard lessons to learn in an army. They're exactly the opposite of what you would learn in an earthly army. Isn't that right? The army of heaven is an army so unlike any other army that it takes a total transformation of mind and character to even survive in it. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind one towards another. This must be the tallest order in the Bible. Do not set your minds on high things, but associate with the humble. That means don't think that you're so great that the humblest of the lowest in the army of the Lord is beyond your reach, beyond your compassion. No, we are a family. We are a family. Do not repay evil with evil and have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And then he ends here, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. He's quoting the Old Testament. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. If he doesn't accept you, well, that's heaping burning coals upon his head. But if he accepts you, you've won a friend. And you've won a soul, and who knows, maybe they too will want to enlist in the army of the Lord. You know, typology is probably one of the most exciting things in the Bible. Because instead of being a dead letter of a bunch of stories, suddenly the Bible jumps to life. <laughs> and every single story becomes a living reality in my own being. And if we could discover this wonderful tool in the toolbox that the Lord has given, He's given us, our church, such a wonderful toolbox. We've got everything in that toolbox to meet just any emergency, any breakdown, any situation. Everything is in that toolbox. We can reach a hard-nosed man with prophecy. You want proof? There it is. We can bring in prophecy. Just take out the prophecy wrench and wrench that nut, that hard nut, until it cracks off. We've got those tools. We've also got the tools of gentleness and kindness and compassion and, you know, the delicate tools to just fine-tune that machine that it doesn't go... <laughs> you know, we need those tools as well. And we cannot only work with the big guys and the big guns. No, we need the goldsmiths and we need the construction worker with a hard hat and the guy using the jackhammer. We need all of those in the army of the Lord. Trust me, I've been in the military before I was here and we have them all. We have them all. And we have such a great captain. I want to go through a typology with you and I want those who have enlisted today in the army of the Lord to look seriously at these issues, not as stories of old. This is the greatest story ever told right here in the Old Testament. It's the story of when David was to become king. Now David is of course a type of Christ and when we enlist on the side of David, it means we are enlisting on the side of Christ. We read in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13, that Saul died in his unfaithfulness. Now the whole battle between good and evil, Saul and David, is a battle between Christ and Satan. Saul is a type of Satan, David is is a type of Christ. And David, of course, was the one who was marginalized. He had to hide in caves. 
He was constantly at, on the run. But there comes a turning point, and this is the turning point that we all need in our lives. The seeming hopelessness, the seeming failure becomes the greatest victory that anyone has ever experienced. Yeah. The cross, wasn't it the greatest apparent failure in the history of the universe? And yet it's the greatest victory ever won. Amen. Chapter 11. Then all Israel came together to David at Hebron. Of course, Paul says, not all that are of Israel are Israel. So who are these who are coming together, typologically speaking? All his people. And they all have to defect. They all have to defect from Saul to come and align themselves with David. And that's what we're seeing here today. People have made a decision to defect, to leave their allegiance for Saul or with Saul and align themselves with David. Also in time past, even when Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord your God said to you, You shall shepherd my people, Israel, and be ruler over my people, Israel. So even if it seems as if Saul was reigning, who was actually in charge? David. David was in charge. And in this world, when I look around me, it seems as if Saul is reigning. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You were the one who brought them in and you brought them out and you were the shepherd of the people, referring to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm interested in this army that sided with David. Verse 4 says, And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem. That's the city of peace which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were. But the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, You shall not come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Christ will conquer irrespective of the opposition. The city of peace, the type of the heavenly Jerusalem, belongs to him and he will reign in that city. It doesn't matter what the opposition says. Now David, whoever had said, whoever attacks the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain, and Joab went and he did it. Now remember in a typology, you don't have to look at the perfection of a character, you're looking at the story. These are the ones who say, here I go, Lord, and I will do it. So Joab became the captain of the army. He became the military leader. And then it lists the mighty men and it tells us who they were. They were Joab and Yashobiam and Eliza were the three great ones and then there were a couple of brothers. And it gives us an amazing insight as to what it means to enlist in the army of the Lord. And it doesn't matter how old or how young you are, you can enlist at any time. Any time. Mighty men whom David had. And then it talks about Yashobiam, the son of, ha of a Hashmonite, chief of the captains. He had lifted up his spear against 300 and he killed them at one time. And then there was Eliezer, Dodo, the Ashohite who was one of the mighty men. And it tells a story about the Philistines who were still there. So even when Christ is kings in our hearts, do the Philistines still harass us, yes or no? Yeah, we're not going to get rid of the Philistines that easily. And it's interesting that these Philistines occupied Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the bread basket. And that is the place where the Messiah 
was going to come forth, the one who is the bread baskets, and they occupied a field, the barley field. And the barley field is a symbol of the first fruits, the wave offering. And that is what we're experiencing today as well. We're experiencing a wave offering, a first fruits. And these three mighty men, they defended this field, and it tells the story of this battle. And they killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. But they still occupied Bethlehem. And David was thirsty. You know the story, right? And he said, who will go and fetch me a drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is at the gate? Symbol of the judgment and the water of life. And the three of them said, we'll do it. And off they went. David didn't know that they were going. And off they went and they fought their way through the Philistines and they got that drink of water and they brought it to David and they said, here it is. And David poured it on the ground and he said, I will not drink this water because the blood of these people of you will be on my head because you have taken this great chance. No, I will suffer with you. Is there another one who said, I will not drink of the vine until you are with me? Is there another one who said that? One who identifies with us, with our hardships and with our sufferings? Is there one like that? This is an amazing story. These are the military giants of Israel. And then it talks about Abishai, the brother of Joab. He was a chief of another three, and it tells of some of his things that he did and how many people he uh, overcame and Beniah, and he uh, killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. Now we read this story and you say, okay, all of these great things that the people did, but there's a lesson in that. So he killed two lion-like heroes of the Moabites. And he killed an Egyptian, a man of great height, five cubits tall. This man was gigantic. Gigantic. And in the Egyptian's hand, it says in verse 23, there was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff, like a shepherd's crook. <laughs> so here comes the Israelite, mighty man of the military. He's got a staff in his hand. The Egyptian is a giant. He has a weaver's beam, like spear. And he goes and wrestles with this man. And he takes the spear from the Egyptian and he kills him with his own spear. <laughs> Terrible stories in the Bible. These are the great men of the army of the Lord. Now, we are enlisting in the army of the Lord and we have people enlisting today. And I want to warn you, you're going to meet an Egyptian. You're going to meet a mighty, mighty giant of an Egyptian and his spear is like a weaver's beam and all you have is a shepherd's crook. And that Egyptian is right inside of us. And every single one of us has to war against the Egyptian and every single one of us has to war against the Moabite the false religion, the syncretism, the mingling of the true and the false. And there were two of them, two Moabites. He killed them. And he killed the Egyptian. And so each and every one of us has to battle and war against the preconceived ideas that we come from. After all, when you were enlisted in Saul's army, David was the enemy. He was the one who was to be hunted. He was the one that had to be annihilated. He's the one that hid in caves. But he's also the one when he had the opportunity to kill Saul. Only cut off a corner of his garment. 
and then went outside and held it up and said, look here, I could have killed you, but I won't do this sort of thing. Did Jesus have an opportunity to kill Satan when he threw him out of heaven? Yes. But his cup of iniquity was not yet full. And so he only cut off a corner of the hem and held it up and said, look, I could have done it to you, but I did not do it to you. Each one of us has a war. Each one of us has a battle. And we will have to study the Word of God diligently, and we'll have to eradicate the Moabite, our false religious concepts, our syncretism, mixing truth and error. We'll have to clean up the house. And the Egyptian, he's a pain in the neck. Kill him. Kill him. Because that's your only salvation. You'll never overcome him. Take his spear. Wipe him out. The call to place all on the altar of service comes to each and every one of us. God will move upon men in humble position to declare the message of present truth. The truth is a fire in their bones, filling them with a burning desire to enlighten those who sit in darkness. So besides the battle raging within, we have a battle raging without. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against principalities and powers and spiritual forces in high places. This is our battle. Like Martin Luther said, let the minds clash. <laughs> but keep the fist down. It's probably the hardest lesson anyone can learn. I have a deep interest in the young men and young women who have enlisted in the army of the Lord. You are laborers together with God. This is very, very important that we learn these lessons. Indeed, it talks about Beaniah in verse 25. He was more honored than the 30, but he did not attain to the first three. Also, the mighty warriors of Asahel, the brother of Jahab. Then it lists some of them and it tells them who they were. And you know what's amazing? They come from every walk of life and they come from every tribe and people and nation and tongue. This is right in the beginning of the history of the children of Israel. And let's have a look at who some of these mighty men were. It's incredible. If I read the, read the list here, it says there was Zelek, the Ammonite. Were those Israelites? No. And then there was Uriah, the Hittite. I mean, that's a pagan nation, a mighty pagan nation. Here were pagans that had enlisted in the army of the Lord, and the Bible lists them as mighty men of God. There's a long, long list. If we go to chapter 12, we learn something interesting about what it means to be enlisted in the army of the Lord. And then it talks in chapter 12 about the mighty men who were helpers in the war. And they were armed with bows using both the right and the left in hurling stones, in shooting arrows. Are we armed with the weapons of warfare? Have we become skilled in using the left hand and the right hand in order to fight this war? Do we study the word? Do we know how to handle this spear? Do we know how to handle it? Do we know the intricacies that one sits down and says, let me show you what the Word of God says? It is our duty when we enlist in God's army to become acquainted with the manual of warfare. It is our duty. Some Gadites joined David at the stronghold, verse 8. 
in the wilderness, mighty men of valor, men trained for battle who could handle the shield and the spear. Do we have some place in the Bible where it defines this armory? Isn't it the shield of faith whereby you can divert the fiery darts of the enemy? And the spear is the equivalent of the sword, which is the word of God. Then came of the sons of Benjamin and Judah, and they came to David. And David said to them, Are you for real? Are you really joining me because you want to, or is this some kind of plot? Each one of us has to investigate. And then he says, David says, there is no wrong in my hands. Who else can say that? Only Jesus can say that. He's saying it as a type of Christ. And then the Spirit came upon Amasai, chief of the captains, and he said, we are yours, O David. And in the place of David, what name do we put there? For Jesus, we are yours, O Jesus, of the Christ. We are on your side, O son, O Jesse. Peace, peace to you and peace to your helpers, for your God helps you. If we enlist in the army of the Lord, there has to be thorough introspection. We have to know why we are joining the army of the Lord. We must be sure we're not doing it out of some hypocritical reason. And then we must do it with our whole heart. And some from Manasseh defected to David. And so the army of the Lord grows. And it says in verse 22, For at that time they came to David day by day to help him until it was a great army like the army of God. Wow, a great army, like the army of God, day by day. And so the army of the Lord is growing all over the world. And people are joining. And when they join, those who have been in the army of the Lord for a long time must look at themselves and say, am I an honest, real defender of the Lord's cause? Or am I not? And they came to David a Hesbron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him. It's going to happen. The kingdom of God is coming. And Saul's reign is coming to an end on this planet. It's not long. And then it lists a few people. And even the relatives of Saul, 29, Close people to Saul. We'll have Satanists join this church. We have already. Occultists join this church, right or wrong? Yeah. They will come, the relatives, the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Fascinating. So in this church, in this army, we have people who can evangelize, who can throw the spear, who have faith, people who have the shield, but we'll also have people who are set as watchmen on the walls of Zion to discern the times in which we live. It is high time we looked at the times we live, we live in again. Because Jesus even admonished the Israelites in his time, he says, you can, you can discern the weather, but you cannot discern the times we live in. If we truly are children in the army of the Lord, we will be watching with great interest the events taking place right now, where people are literally rushing to fulfill the prophecies, where there are calls for Sunday worship, even from the highest levels. And are we going to remain asleep in the face of all of this? We need people who understand the times. 
We need all of these people. And now please note, verse 38, all these men of war who could keep rank came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest of Israel were of one mind. If we take our commitment seriously, if we delve into this word once again as though we were enlisting right now, if we did that, and we studied our responsibility, and we studied the times we are living in, we would be of one mind. And we could realize that we have to keep rank. There are so many elements pushing us apart. So many factions in the church. There are so many who want to go this way with some pet theory and that way with some pet theory. The times are serious. Keep rank. Or as another person says, press together, press together, press together. This is no time to sleep. And we need a loyal heart to make David king over Israel and all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. And then this chapter ends with two verses that seem to be periphery on the periphery to this war. And they were there with David three days, eating and drinking, for their brethren had prepared for them. Moreover, those who were near to them, from as far away as Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali, were bringing food on donkeys and camels, on mules and oxen, provisions of flour and cakes and figs and raisins and wine and oil and oxen and sheep, abundantly, for there was joy in Israel. Without provisions, no army can succeed. Without provisions, you can forget to fight a war. You will not win a war on an empty stomach in the freezing cold and blasts of wind. And what is the provision? The provision is the Word of God. And we need men and women who make it their duty to supply the armies of the living God with the food and the substance they need to fight this battle. It is time to stop playing church. It is time to delve into the Word of God and find the very food we need for the time we live in. It's not just good enough to have the ordinary things. We need it all. We need every possible vehicle, whether it's the donkey, the camel, the mule, the ox. Everyone has a job to do. The one is a workhorse, the other one is transport, the other one is your four by four. Four by four camel. Here we go. Cakes and figs and raisins and wine and oil. We need the unction of the Holy Spirit in order to fight this battle. And then as we celebrate today, new enlisters in the army of the Lord. Let those who have been in this war a long time and have grown tired take heart. The time is near. The Lord is coming. We're going home soon. Our general who has never lost a battle expects willing, faithful service from everyone who has enlisted under his banner. And in the closing controversy now waging between the forces of good and the hosts of evil, he expects all laymen as well as ministers 
to take part. All who enter are not generals, captains, sergeants, or even corporals. All have not the care and the responsibilities of leaders. But it requires many soldiers to form the rank and file of the army. Yet its success defend, depends upon the fidelity of every soldier. One man's cowardice or treachery may bring disaster upon the entire army. May the Lord of hosts help us as we prepare for the final battle to take cognizance of our decision to join the ranks of the Lord's army. Let us welcome every new soldier who places his allegiance under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. And let's prepare for the greatest event and the greatest battle this world has ever seen. Amen. Amen.